Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship God. Let me point out uh, the announcements that there's things that uh, we need to know about. Just a moment. We've got to disappear. Over the years, I've realized I'm carrying more paper than I used to. Uh, and so I, uh, if I drop something, I apologize. Uh, can everybody see okay? Don't need the lights on? Okay, okay. Uh, a reminder about, uh, I mentioned last week too, about keys and security codes. Codes when you leave the church. Uh, make sure that you've locked, the, if you're the last one out, make sure that you know lights are off, make sure that uh, the doors you would go out are locked. Uh, if, if somebody, like, we found, we found uh, a door, the front door out here open the other day. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't locked and the coat, and of course, I don't know, I don't know why the alarm didn't go off, but it didn't. I guess as long as the door didn't open, nobody was gonna, nobody was gonna know about it. But anyway, just a reminder of that, please, uh, I've taken to kind of wandering around the church every so often just to make sure things are, I push doors and things, making sure they're closed. Uh, next, next, this coming Tuesday, we will have concerts in the park. Sorry for all the confusion last week. Uh, there'll be a concert on Tuesday with Sherry Cornell at 7 p.m. and on Thursday, uh, the 17th, same twice this week, Thundercraft at 7 o'clock. Uh, I don't know what the prob some of the problems were, but this is the way they're, they're fixing it. Hi. Oh, that, what, what messed with it was the Edgewood graduation. Okay, that makes sense. And then two, Tuesday the 22nd, Dennis Ford will be here. I guess everyone waits for Dennis Ford to come, so he's coming on the 22nd. Uh, session meeting this week, the 17th at 6.30. And also I wanted you to note the uh, North Kingsville Presbyterian Church has started a community farmer's market. On Fridays, you can see the dates are listed there from June 11th through September 24th, from 9 to 1. Uh, if you're interested in informa more information or host table, there's a, a woman you can call and speak to her about it. Uh, also, a list of our food of the food pantry needs. Sometimes I think we get used to bringing the same things over and over and don't realize that sometimes they need other things as well. Uh, everybody on this side this week, you you wave to the other side and say, the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And everybody over here, wave back and say, and also with you. Also with you. Now you say, the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And over here you say, and also with you. Also with you. Thank you. I was overjoyed when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. In times of trouble, when so much we rely on seems so uncertain, it is a pleasure to meet all of you here today. Like faithful people of old, we gather to worship the Lord our God. This is where we learn God's ways, and that we may walk in His paths. Let us continue with our responsive call to worship. If any person lives in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is finished and gone. Let us prepare to celebrate the new realm of God, where the meek inherit the earth, and the sincere smart see God. Do not be impressed by the outward appearance of a person, for God does not see like we do. If anyone travels with Christ, all things are obsolete, all things become new. Let us pray. Eternal God, we worship you in your greatness. We give you our endless praise. Through you comes the energy, energy by which the world was made. Through you comes the very breath which gives us life. And yet you chose to reveal your power and your glory through one who serves others, one in whom you delight, one who is gentle and persistent in the pursuit of justice. Accept our prayers and praises for, for revealing your love for the world in such a graceful and transforming way. 
and bless us as we seek to serve you with gentleness, compassion, and the same persistence of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Our first hymn is, Come Sing, O Church in Joy. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, led by the Spirit, let us seek the love of God through the grace of Christ Jesus our Savior. Let us confess our sins together. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are grateful how you have blessed our lives with the gift of the Holy Spirit so that our faith has miraculously and mysteriously grown. We confess the times we fail to involve ourselves in planting any seeds of faith in the lives of others, the times when our personal agendas become more important than yours the times when our lives become so entangled with the values of the world that we forget what you have said and done and promised. Lord Jesus Christ, we know that when we become disconnected from you, our lives become harsh and unfruitful, 
and our faith becomes stunted and dry. Renew our lives, we pray, so that we may remain connected to you. Strengthen our faith to expand and grow strong, to bear fruit of your love and your undying life. Amen. Family of God, lift up your spirits with thanksgiving to God, whose nature is always to have mercy. All who have come clean and sought forgiveness shall never need to revisit old shame again. The untarnished future is God's and is now offered to you with open hands. You are forgiven. All things have become new. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yet, when planted, it grows 
and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Amish north of Orwell were going to church today. I didn't realize it until we moved out here, and maybe it's not this way everywhere, but, but the Amish around us worship every other Sunday. And that's not something I'm suggesting for all of you. But I actually got to ask an Amish man a couple of years ago, you know, why, why, they, why they worship this way, because the Amish north of town are, are, are worshiping today, but the Amish who are west of town, they're not worshiping today. Next week it'll be opposite. But going out today, I was a little earlier than usual, and I must have passed, I'll bet, eight different buggies. I even saw one turning in so I know where they were meeting, whose home they were meeting in that today. And I must have seen four or five other groups uh, who were walking close enough that they didn't need to hook up their buggy, uh, they could walk to church. Including the, the best one of all, it looked like a father with his daughter in her little stroller, and she had a little tiny bonnet on her head and a little, little white, white apron over her dress, and she was just the prettiest thing I've seen. <laughs> it was really wonderful. Uh, of course, you know, the other thing about Amish worship is it starts at, well, it must have been 8.30 or 9 o'clock. But it doesn't end until noon. It doesn't end until lunchtime. You know, if we start till 10, we try to get you out of here by 11, a little after, a little before. Depends how I'm preaching that day. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like, and also today says, and with what will, shall we compare the kingdom of God? Jesus is talking in parables again. In my younger years, I loved parables. Somehow I thought they were easy to preach. Sometimes I thought they were simple and, and gave, and uh, were easy to understand and, and, and made an easy sermon. And a few years ago, I kind of hit a wall and I suddenly realized that parables were perhaps the hardest thing to preach. Because we're comparing parables to our own lives. The root word for parable in Greek is parabola. There's also a word in Hebrew, which I can't remember and didn't try to look up. But they both mean to lay two things side by side and compare them. And when we're preaching parables, when we're talking about parables, we're talking about what Jesus is talking about the kingdom, and we're talking about our lives next to that parable. Jesus' purpose, I think, in telling parables, part of it, he says, is to, because it's a mystery. It's something you have to discern. It's something you have to work out. Maybe that's why I've decided they're hard. Because they do sometimes become very difficult to work out. But they're meant to stimulate our imagination so that we recognize the power and the presence of God in our lives in a new and immediate personal way. Today, where Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he's talking about 
the kingdom being dependent upon God's grace and to some extent human initiative. A farmer went out and threw seed on the ground. So there's some human initiative going on. I've been watching the fields as they've started up. Uh, I can tell I, I, a, a week ago, I was staring at fields and trying to decide, is that going to be corn or is that going to be beans? And now I can tell you, oh, that's corn, that's beans. I can also tell you that closer to Austinburg, they got their seed in earlier than they did down in Orwell. And in south of Orwell, they also got the seed in. The Orwell farmers must be slowing down this year. The kingdom is dependent upon God's grace and on human initiative. Last week I got our garden in. George and I got our garden in. The first day was pretty easy. We just we had a few few uh, herb plants that we had bought the and we put them in, and then we put some some a, a couple of rows of seeds of different herbs in. Then we planted some some green beans and some beets and some uh, shard. And then I planted the rest of our, of our flats, our, our tomatoes, our, our eggplant, uh, green, green peppers. And then the last little bit was, was a part that I cover with, with uh, landscape fabric. And I put in some zucchini there. I put in some, uh, some cucumbers and some winter squash. So I go out every day and look at the garden. Herbs are not doing anything. My wife keeps saying, they take a long time to sprout. OK. Green beans have started to come up. If you come and look at our green beans, you'll see an army of plastic forks sticking up <laughs> alongside them. Uh, I've, I've always had trouble with the birds. They see that little green thing you know, before the, before the top pops out. They see that little green thing and think it's a worm and grab it. And so I, we read something that said you stick these forks in on either side and that keeps the birds don't know what to do with those little forks so they stay away. So far it's working. I saw, to, saw yesterday for the first time saw, saw beets and shard. When I opened, I was stunned. When I opened, we bought, we bought some of our seeds from Amish just like we bought our flats from the Amish. Uh, when I opened up this, this bag of, that's had zucchini in it, you know, you don't need to plant a lot of zucchini because it produces a lot. But I was stunned to open this bag and find six seeds. Six seeds. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six seeds. Five of the six have come up. I still am hoping for that sixth one. But none of the, none of the cucumbers or, or uh, other squash have come in yet. So I understand what he's saying about, about seeds. There's nothing I can do about it except look at it and say, is there enough water on it? Right now, at least. Later on, maybe I can do something for them. But, but this is all I can do right now is watch them keep an eye out. Uh, the, first, the first day I planted, we planted, we got it all done. By the time we were done, it was, I was too tired to uh, put up a fence. We'd seen some bunnies this year a little closer to the garden than we usually have seen them. Never have had to worry about it before. Five, five gardens, never had to worry. Uh, back in Pennsylvania, I had electric fence around my garden out there. I mean, it was, it was bad. And so, so this year, I, sa I said, well, I'll do the, I'll do the, I'll do the fence tomorrow. Next morning I went out and looked, and a rabbit or something had come along and taken the top off one of my peppers and one of my eggplant. That could be part of the parable, but I'm not sure what it is yet. You think about that, and maybe if you think of something, you can let me know what you think is going on there. So, so as far as gardening is going, we're doing pretty good this year. But as it says in the parable, it's, it has nothing to do with me. I put the seeds in the ground and I just have to trust that God and, and the, the weather and everything cooperates and the seeds are good 
and they spring up. The story in some sense reminds us that the kingdom is not a frantic place of, work, of works righteousness. You understand about works righteousness, the idea that you have to do all these things for God in order for God to look at you with, with favor. You know, it kind of goes against the concept of grace. The kingdom is not a frantic place of works righteousness where we all have to be busy like the ants we see on the ground or maybe in our homes. Nor is the kingdom a place for our attachments to various moral and doctrinal principles. Jesus didn't say anything about that when he said the farmer threw seeds on the ground and waited for the seeds to grow. He didn't have to go out and preach over the ground. He didn't have to go and teach him what it means to be a good Presbyterian. What we are supposed to know, or supposed to start to understand, is that working for the kingdom is a good thing. Knowing what we believe is a good thing too. But we sometimes confuse the ways of the kingdom with our ways. We sometimes think that, that we have to have the answers to all our moral issues, we have to have the answers to all our doctrinal issues, <coughs> So that, we can, so that we can stand upright and moral and when we see somebody doing something wrong, we can tell them. Years ago, there was a program, an evangelism program called Evangelism Explosion. I actually went looking through your library to see if you had a copy. Almost every, every Presbyterian church does. I didn't see one here. And that's okay. Because the problem with evangelism ex explosion, it was, it, was, it was created by a church down in Florida. Can't remember the name of it now, one of the big churches down in Florida. The problem with it is it tries to answer all the questions. You know, when I, when I, when I, a few weeks ago when I talked about the Trinity with you, I said, I don't understand it. You don't understand it. None of us really understands it. It's one of the mysteries of faith, so to speak. They try to give you an answer that you can give to someone else in short sentences and easy, easy phrases. And they do that with lots of different things because that's what they think is going to happen when you go out and start knocking on people's doors or you start talking to them about faith or talking to them about your church. They're going to come back to you with all kinds of things. Sometimes they do. This caller is deadly. You walk into some place like Walmart sometimes, got a collar like this on, somebody is not bound to, but occasionally someone comes up to me and says, I got a question. It's not going to be what time's church on Sunday. And then they end up in a 15 minute discussion with somebody, or we're even worse sometimes. There's also an emphasis in these parables, and perhaps in all the parables, because some of them are a little easier to, to open up than others, but not necessarily e as e not easy to understand, just because we can unpack them easier. There's an es emphasis on mystery and surprise. We don't know how or when something's going to happen. But when the seeds spring up, I'm surprised. When the seeds spring up, I'm excited. When the seeds spring up, I'm happy. Because I know that, that what little I had to do has come to fruition in some, some sense. But you know what I start doing then is I start worrying. What if we have a big storm? What if the wind blows hard and the rain comes down hard? Which does happen occasionally. And it knocks my plants down. Or it, it soaks, soaks the ground so much that it rots the seeds. Part of the mystery is recognizing that there's, sometimes there's nothing we can do about things. Sometimes we just have to live with what happens 
and do the best we can. A few years ago, the, Pre the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church met in Pittsburgh. I took a week off from work uh, so I could go down and volunteer. And while I was there, I saw a man named Dave Feldman. Dave and I went to college uh, his last couple of years, my first couple of years. Um, he left, went to Princeton Seminary in New Jersey. When I graduated from college, I went out to Princeton as well. And, and he, was, he was married at that point, and, and I got to visit him and his wife. He, they drove me around, New Jer around Princeton, show me around a little bit. The first time I was driving, he was, he was driving, I was sitting in the back seat, and we were on this two-lane road with a, with a shoulder on each side. As I, there was a car up in front with their left turn signal on, and a lot of cars coming. So as he's coming up to this, I ne had never seen this before at that point in my life, he suddenly veered to the right, went on the shoulder, and went around the car. I said, what are you doing? He says, if we don't, if we don't do that, we'll never get anywhere. Maybe that's a parable, too. Because most places, that's not, that's, that's illegal. Anyway, Dave and I, I met Dave at this meeting, and we were talking together, kind of catching up on whatever, what we were doing, where we were, what we'd been up to, and then a, a man that Dave knew came along, and we started, he sort of joined the conversation, and Dave looked at him and said, John and I were in college together and seminary together, he says, we thought we were going to change the church. We were going to transform the church. And that's what they kind of do with you at seminary. They kind of get you feeling that you're ready to go out and just change the world. And that's not exactly how it works. And it's certainly not how the parable teaches it works. What Ezekiel brings to us today, and let me bring him in for a moment, Ezekiel comes from the time of the Babylon, what's called the Babylonian captivity. The northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed in the 700s BC, and in the 500s, Babylon came along and conquered Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah. Took the king and all the royal people and all the wealthy people, anybody with any authority, took them back to Babylon and left everybody else to fend for themselves. That's what Ezekiel is, where, where Ezekiel is. E Ezekiel is one of the prophets that was taken to, to Babylon. Jeremiah, on the other hand, is one that was left in Israel, there in Judah. So Ezekiel writes to Israel as they are in exile in Jerusalem, or exile in Babylon, and says to them, God is in control of things. God will do what he wants done when he wants it done. And we can pray, and we can praise God, and we can work, but God will bring about things in his own time. And, talks, and he talks about this image of breaking off a, the, the bow, topmost bough of the cedar tree and planting it, and how it will grow to be great and strong. That's not our job. That's not our work. Sometimes I think what we're supposed to just try to do is try to, to love each other and care for each other. And whatever else happens is up to God. Parables compare our lives, our church, what we're doing, to what God is doing. Sometimes, sometimes the result isn't great. Sometimes the result isn't pretty. But what it teaches us, what it, what it reminds us is that 
In some sense, God is actually running things even when we think we are. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves to take a deep breath and step back and sit down and wait. Sometimes it reminds us that for all our running around, we can't do as much as if we would just stop and pray and wait for God to accomplish His work. His work. Now please join me in singing hymn, uh, Lord of All Good, hymn number 375. seated or you can stay standing, whichever you like. Now let us uh, affirm our faith by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, our creator and our ruler, we meet to praise you by the lifting up of our voices and our hearts and our lives to you, the Father, the Father everlasting. Great and marvelous are your works. You call the mighty rivers down to the sea. Yet you also guide the tiny tendrils of the climbing vine into the crevices of the wall. And it is your wondrous providence that marks a pathway through the sky to lead the migrating bird to its home again. O oh God, hear us as we join your whole creation in songs and vows of adoration.
O oh, great God, to whom we owe each breath of our life, we thank you for the joy of thanksgiving. Since you have surrounded us with tokens, with countless tokens of your love, it would be a thing hard to bear not to be able to pour out our gratitude in return for the light that shines in the laughing eyes of children, for the greetings of a good and faithful friend, and above all, for the love that came into the world in Christ and resides still in the church, we give you thanks. Gracious Father, listen to us as we, as we remember before you all those who have need of your mercy. We pray for one another, for our church and its ministry to this community. We pray for those dear to us whose names you know, who are in danger or in pain or in the midst of trials of body and soul. Especially do we pray for those who do not know how to pray for themselves. Hear us, Lord, as we, as we lift up those whose lives have been brought, brought to us, whose attention has been brought to us. We pray this day for Adam and Alan, for Kim and Jim, for Sarah and Carl, for AJ and Mary Jane, Chris and Donna and Bill, for Ken and John and Evan and the Smiths. We pray for Charlene, for Len and Joyce, for Sarah and Betty, for the Brown family as they return home this week. Oh God, who is always present, as you have filled this time and this place with your nearness, go with us every hour of this week, erecting barriers of, barriers of judgment across every evil path we are tempted to enter, guiding us by your holy laws in every, into every good work to do your will. For so alone may we, may we fulfill our heart's desire to be your people after the perfect pattern of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray, amen. Jesus said, said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So thank you this week for your support, for your presence today, for your, for your gifts, uh, for your financial support that makes it possible for us to do this work. Uh, it is all very much appreciated. Uh, I'll thank you again for the for your generous donations for the food banks and for all the other things. I'm sure I know that there's things that all of you do uh, around town and perhaps even further away than that that reaches out and touches, touches people in our community and around the world. Now let us stand and sing the doxology. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Great God, we sing that mighty hand. finish this service by reminding ourselves that it is not we who chose Christ, but Christ who chose us. Let us recall that we were not here because of our goodness, but because of Christ's grace. Let us remember that we were not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us. And keep in mind that we do not go our separate ways alone, but in the company of the Holy Spirit, who has great things in store for us. Grace, mercy, and peace from God most wonderful will be your benediction today and always. Amen. Please come downstairs for coffee afterward. Last week we didn't get a chance to go in. I got talking too long. You got a few minutes? Yes. After about 10 minutes, I'll come and look for you. Okay. We'll